GPX remove all GPX open Utah all right got you working got you working it's the 26th of May and we are in Mexican Hat Utah just outside of Monument Valley and it is absolutely stunning I always kind of forget how beautiful Monument Valley is So this was the San Juan Inn and Trading Post, and honestly, that was very enjoyable. Today is Thursday, this weekend is Memorial Day weekend, and so Moab is going to be an absolute shit show. So I'm not looking to try and stay in Moab for any length of time. I do have to go through there because I have to pick up a general delivery package, which is another SSD for me to store footage. I have two, well I have three two terabyte SSDs with me, and I'm able to put basically six or so days of footage onto those, which is normally enough, but I'm realizing that if I get behind kind of on my editing, I could absolutely run out of storage space. And so what I did was I got a four terabyte SSD, and so that way I can put up to another basically two weeks of footage on that. And so I gotta pick that up in Moab, otherwise I have nothing to do in Moab. And so with it being Memorial Day weekend, I'm just gonna try and get through Moab. But today I'm gonna get to Monticello, which is about 170 miles, and stay there for a full day so that I can edit another one of the New Mexico videos and get both of those uploaded. And then that, w and then basically that would put me going through Moab on Saturday, which is not ideal, but at least I can get through Moab and camp somewhere on the other side of it. The first section of snow that I may have to avoid is in that day, and so it may kind of shorten my day to where I just kind of have to blow through Moab and get going. Order of business for today, we have Moki Dugway, which is going to be a ton of fun. Definitely going to get the drone out for that. And then just kind of general riding until I get into Monticello. So we'll see what the Utah BDR has in store. One of the things I was kind of talking to myself about this morning is all of the videos of the Utah BDR tend to really focus on like the Four Corners area and Moab area, especially Lockhart Basin if they do it, because that's the most like hardcore part of the areas of the Utah BDR. The, the problem is you don't really get to see the rest of the Utah PDR, so I don't have a really good feel for like what the rest of the Utah PDR is gonna look like, other than knowing that I'm not gonna do Lockhart Basin because uh, I'm by myself and I'm not an idiot. I don't really know what the rest of the Utah BDR is gonna look like once I get out of, you know, here, the Monument Valley area, which by the way, holy crap. If you've never been to Monument Valley, like, come down here and spend some time and check it out because this part of Utah is unbelievable. I'm sore after yesterday. I think I think this morning was the first time I've woken up and actually said, wow, my ankle actually hurts. Uh, I did like 330 miles yesterday with about 150, 130, something like that of that, being off-road and really bad washboard. All right. Straight into the first water crossing. Which I want to go over here a little bit. Here we go. But yeah, it's just views for views. Nothing but views. I have no idea on the difficulty level of today. It could be like this basically the whole time, or it could get super gnarly for all I know. I really don't know, and I'm not sure I care that much. Like, it's going to be so much fun. So far, I'm really happy with what shape this road is in. It's just fantastic. I'm going to be taking it easy. Yeah, Moki Dugway switchbacks, 15 miles. just 
just enjoying the scenery. I, like, I got nothing to say. <laughs> just enjoy the view, guys. Just giant, towering cathedrals of rock everywhere you see. So the thing that Utah has, that just about no other part of the country has, is slick rock, which is basically sandstone that's been smoothed by water action and then wind and whatever else. It's a very strange surface to ride on because if it's dry, you have way more traction than you expect. Slick rock is tacky when it's dry. When it's wet, it becomes slick rock. And it's nearly unrideable. Um, it just becomes like ice. There have been hikers and stuff that have gotten stuck in areas around Utah because they got stuck in a rainstorm or something and they basically couldn't walk out. Didn't sleep that great last night, to be honest. But yeah, I really I kind of struggled sleeping last night. I woke up a bunch. Is this, is there a ranch out here? Dude, prime real estate. Bed and breakfast, oh my God. <laughs> Wonder how long that's been in the family. I'm gonna go with, um, a long friggin' time.
roads impassable when wet. Just like basically everything else in Utah. You can see how bad this would be if it was wet. I mean, you just wouldn't be able to do it. I'm interested what this thing is coming up called the twist. It's 12 miles away and I haven't heard of it on anything until it came up as a waypoint on my map. What is the twist? Does it mean the trail gets like super hard and it's like a twist in the plot? Or does the trail like just do like a figure eight or something? Ooh, that's sandy, okay. Let's go right there, there we go. Yeah, I can't really side hill and sand. You could try, <laughs> it's probably not gonna end well. Sometimes on the Slick Rock, it can be hard to tell where the damn road goes. Some of the trails around Moab and stuff, they actually paint either arrows or markers. A lot of it has tire marks and stuff on it now, but, but yeah, I mean, there can be areas where you're just like, so where'd the road go? <laughs> like, where does it want me to go? Because I don't understand. <laughs> not really a step, that's not bad. You can see here where they used the, some tool to smooth the road out. And some other kind people have lined the roadway with rocks to give you a better idea where the road is. But yeah, there's your introduction to slick rock riding. All right, back to a little bit of sand. That's not bad at all. A lot of this, there seems to be sand on top, but there's a nice hard bottom to it. So you don't really sink. i drop the second for this. Yeah, this is just super fun riding. Like it's not crazy technical or anything. But you definitely gotta stay awake. Why did people go around that? That was random. And with the rock being so tacky most of the time, like, you can get traction in some places that you would never expect to. So some of the off-road vehicles, I mean, they, they can climb stuff that they just don't look like they should be able to go up. <laughs> you know, dirt bikes too. Like there's some, you know, uh, five miles of hell is back here. Considered basically one of the hardest dirt bike tracks out, you know, that the public can just go out and ride. And yeah, I mean, it goes up some stuff where you're just like, really? <laughs> You, you want me to take my bike there? <laughs> I kind of wonder what, like, what's the dumbest bike somebody's taken on five miles of hell? Has somebody tried to take a CT90 or something? I know people have taken, like, XR600s and, you know, like some fairly large dirt bikes. I don't think you could take an adventure bike up there. Maybe, like, somebody like Polterres or somebody could. But most people, there's just no way. I mean, there's some steps and stuff on it that are just gigantic. That'd be an interesting thing. Somebody send this video to Pole Tears and be like, hey, take your Tenere 700 on five miles of hell. You've done Red Bull Romaniacs and you know, all those crazy things. I bet you, you could get a Tenere through. I don't know that anybody else could. It's all the little lizards sunning themselves. There still seems to be some kind of a bottom to it though, so I'm not like really digging in, you know? And the bike bike is floating really well, so that's definitely helping me out. Yep, definitely more on the sandy side of things now. Some people like to really ride fast through this stuff. 
and that can be really fun don't get me wrong but you know again I'm you know I'm traveling I have all my stuff with me I'm trying to complete the route I don't need to go fast through here I just need to get through here yeah that's a little deep in a couple places I think this is a good introduction stage to Utah like you've got slick rock you've got sand you've got you know all the things that make riding in Utah kind of unique in the first stage so it kind of gets you prepared for the latter stages I would think because yeah if you're just absolutely hating this first stage of Utah I guess you're not gonna like the less than later sections first gear and the, oh here's the twist okay because you come down and you have a nice switchback with sand I'm sure for Jeeps that's fun I'm still on route yeah okay <laughs> it's like where the f did I just go yeah, the road's over here. Cool off, 75 degrees, which is great. It's just I was working kind of hard there. Going straight, that's fairly deep sand. I need to turn, come on, there we go. Bonk. Yeah, I mean, you just, you gotta steer with your feet and throttle. Sometimes speed and confidence is your friend. Other times you gotta chill the F out and just pick your way through. Oh yeah, here's sand, legit. <laughs> I think there's gonna be a fair bit of that on the exit here. Whoa, there we go. God, I hate that feeling. Stream, nope. Sand though. Let's go over here. Relax. And just follow the ruts. Oh, I think there we go. Yeah, I knew that was gonna happen. Some of this, the sand's just churned up because of uh, 4x4s and stuff. Hills and turns and stuff, instead of making washboard, they make sand. <laughs> That's definitely sand. And deep, holy crap. Oh, that was really deep, holy crap. That like stopped me. Ugh. Over here. <clears throat> nope. <clears throat> that was a good one. <laughs> oh god. Whew. Yeah, we're gonna walk the bike out of this one. Holy crap. Alright. here cleaned off yeah this stuff is super loose we're just gonna walk it out of here the problem is so you can kind of tell but there are deep ruts in the middle where the tires have gone through where probably people have gone through when it was wet and the rut has hard edges so I think what happened was I got onto, I, well, I hit one of those ruts, but then it tried to climb out of the rut and pushed me way over here. All right, first gear, nice and easy. Did 
Didn't break anything, didn't bend anything, didn't really do anything to the bike as far as I can tell. It just hit the wall of the ravine back there. The sands of Utah claim another victim. One of the things that happens on this bike is the handlebars, the risers get slightly twisted. And so the triple clamp's not twisted, you know, the the nothing nothing's actually bent or anything like that, but you have a fall like that or something, it feels like your handlebars are torqued. And they are, just very slightly. And it's because the risers have little, like almost a vibration reducer or something in them, so they're able to move just slightly. And so you just take it and you bang it the other direction against the stop, and it centers it out. And that seems to work pretty quite well, so, okay. Hey, something on the internet was right. <laughs> wash apparently hopefully it doesn't just follow the wash <laughs> oh god all right we're gonna go slow New Mexico deep sections of sand no Utah yes sandy patches I'm good with I just don't want a mile of it, you know? I just, oh, come on. All right, we're gonna go slow. If I have to, I'll go down to first and just chug through. Back to rock. It's fun when your bike and your handlebars aren't going the same directions. Can't go fast because I can't see the bumps, but this is fine. I mean, it's just rock. I just had a, uh, oh yeah, this is my job moment. <laughs> It was kind of, it's kind of the first time I've had one of those of like, I'm in the back country of Utah, riding my motorcycle across the desert by myself in 90 degree heat. And technically this is for work. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I keep getting asked what my plans are for the winter and I really haven't thought about it. I'm gonna have footage to edit, you know, some of these videos, like Northeast and stuff like that, are going to be done over the winter, for sure. I wanted to come down and do California and Nevada in the winter, so like November. But other than that, I don't really know what I'm gonna do. You know, I don't, I don't know. Because I, I do want to travel internationally at some point. I mean, I have a whole bucket list of ride stuff on my computer. I want to do Alaska. I want to do the Trans-America Trail. Like, I've got, you know, I've got a bunch of stuff that I would like to do. I just don't know yet. And, you know, right now, this isn't self-supporting. It's kind of hard for me to make plans out past the point where I actually start making enough money on this to support myself and not eat savings to really kind of think about how I want to do that. As it stands right now, you know, I don't have the viewership and the money to even think about doing that kind of stuff. You know, I, I have enough to be able to do this for this year. And if it doesn't become a thing at that point, reach out to various motorcycle organizations about working for them. Because I have all of this experience and made these videos and did all this stuff. So 
that's that's pretty much where I'm at right now. And I'm gonna go up over here. Oh, that was sand. Deep in between those freaking rocks. God. That should have been a first gear climb, but I made it. Oh, I see sand. All right. Let's see what we can do here. Oh, come on. Yeah, deep sand trying to go up a rocky hill is not a fun combination. Here's a big dirt road. It'll be coming. All right. That's gonna be a first gear climb. That's pretty loose in a couple areas too. That's steep as hell, man. I know you probably can't tell from the camera, but that's a really steep climb. Up another first gear climb. God, this is like some of the stuff in Colorado. You just go straight up the damn hill. don't like is the loose bits. Whew, there's a view. If you didn't have good tires, that would be a nightmare. You'd never make it up that damn thing. That looks like it washed out or something. They put a culvert in in the middle there. But it was real loose. All this is very loose. Oh, that's super loose. Wow. Whoa, that's deeper than it looks. We're gonna go to first. That didn't even look like sand. In fact, I'm not even sure that it is. I think it's just they graded it and so it's loose as hell. It, it's really like it's not sand it's it's it feels like I'm trying to ride ugh, through potting soil it would be terrifying trying to ride fast through this stuff because you would be cooking along and all of a sudden the bike would just try and bury itself and yes I know I'm sitting I'm trying to be prepared to need to put my feet out it's not even like technical riding. That's, I mean, that's the unfortunate part of it. Like it's not difficult, it's not, you know, well, it's not easy, it's, it's fairly difficult. It's just that it's not interesting riding. It's not technical in a way that makes it fun. It's just technical in a way that makes it difficult. Hold on a minute, what is this? I'm gonna go right at this next intersection and go down into Blanding. Because this road is I'm, I'm not doing this for another 80 miles. It is just loose and chunky and a mess. And it doesn't accomplish anything. It's not even like riding in sand. And if I go right at the road down here, I go into Blanding. So I'm going to do that. And I don't care if you want to be like, man, he didn't do the route. It's 90 degrees. I can't go more than about 20 miles an hour because it's like riding through potting soil. And I'm not trying to exhaust myself or get hurt. All right, uh, and yeah, here's the road, okay. I'm gonna take it off, follow me. All right, so the route goes way around that way, all through the mountains and da 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 da, down to Monticello. This road goes straight down to Blanding and then I can go to Monticello. That whole section was just garbage. The climbs were kind of fun, 
and maybe the road's like this the rest of the way. I don't know, but I don't want to take that chance. So I'll take the shortcut into Blanding, probably take a break for lunch, and then head over to Monticello and work on uploading footage. Oh, pavement. All right. I will talk to you in Blanding, I guess. Eventually. Tomorrow. Well, good afternoon from Monticello, Utah. I am editing footage. I already did my resupply, I haven't packed anything up yet. But the plan tomorrow is to get an early start because I need to be in Moab before noon because I have a package waiting for me at General Delivery. And then I should arrive in Price on the 30th. And the plan right now is to stay in Price until the 6th, or I'm sorry, until the 4th of June because I need to let snow clear. Uh, I did talk to a group who came, went through and they got to a little bit north of Price and hit snow that they couldn't get through. So the idea is that hopefully with a week or two of it being in the 80s, which is what it's supposed to be, we could maybe get it open. So that's the hope at least. And there's a dealership there which is going to do tires chain, service. I hit 10,000 miles, so it's about due anyway. At that point, um, even if my tires are dead, I can ride those to South Dakota and I'm gonna probably drop ship stuff to the Dakota 600 and do oil and tires when I get there. Just finishing up on day four of the New Mexico BDR video right now. So I could very well finish this video tonight, but yeah, we're doing good. So this was a really good stop. Um, this is the Atomic Motor, Atomic Blue Motor Inn in Monticello, Utah. But yeah, really nice. I was, I, you know, this is not an expensive room and it's really, really nice. So, yeah. And the internet works great, which I really needed because I was able to get the day three video uploaded super easy. I've been struggling to get that uploaded since Cameron. It'll be camping the next two nights and then in, it's the Liberty Inn or something like that in Price. And I'll hopefully be able to get you know, two videos finished while I'm there and the service done on the bike and let the weather clear a little bit before I go north. So that's what we're doing. I will see you bright and early tomorrow morning. Later. Wakey, wakey. It is not quite seven, so I'm doing good. This is basically the only day where I'm gonna have kind of a time constraint on me because I have a general delivery package waiting for me in Moab with a new hard drive. I need that for footage. 60 degrees. It's apparently going to be fairly cool, like cooler today and kind of the next couple of days. That was a good break. Got day three of New Mexico uploaded. Got day four finished and uploaded. Penguin Mills. I'm surprised you guys are turning actually because it's not very windy. Oh, hi, dear. Hey, little guy. You're fine. Really enjoyed that stay. So that was the Atomic Blue Motor Inn in Monticello, Utah. It was excellent. Not really expensive, and they clearly just renovated that, and it was wonderful. So there's a diversion on this from LaSalle towards Moab. This would, if I was doing Lockhart Basin, this is also where I would dip off and connect to Lockhart Basin. But I'm not doing that because.
so I'm by myself and I'm not stupid. But there's also a winter diversion for the an area around Lasalle because the regular route goes up into the mountains to the east of like Lasalle and Moab and all that and loops back around and that's not clear. I'm basically going to connect through to the Lasalle off-road. That's another deer on the side of the road. Looks like it might be a rock. Oh, that's deer. Thank you. So I'm gonna connect through to LaSalle off-road and then basically just hit the road and get to Moab so that I can get to the post office. So I don't expect anything too crazy, but that's why I'm up and moving before seven. I was actually up at like 5.30. It's just, it wasn't light yet and I'm not gonna go ride the dark. More deer, good Lord. You're all there on both sides of the road. You're all out. <laughs> 5 a.m. on your birthday. Happy birthday! What are you doing? All right, here's the route. If I follow the strict route, it's 165 miles to Moab, but that includes basically two loops that I'm not doing. So I may go ahead and just kill the cameras until I hit dirt. These clouds are gonna be nice if they stick around. A few inches later. All right, I'm getting ready to turn. Pretty sure it's going to dirt. All right, so I could didn't go past Newspaper Rock. I didn't realize that that's actually on the route to Lockhart Basin. So that's too bad. I was kind of looking forward to maybe seeing that. I'm expecting it to be fairly chill. Lockhart's obviously very difficult, but it's the most difficult section of any BDR. And this is just the non-expert route. Having that time off in Bryce is gonna be nice. I mean, it's not, it's just gonna be time off from riding because I'm still gonna be working on editing footage. And we'll see what Utah ends up looking like, you know? Oh, that's sandy, come on. I want up on the center, there we go. I want the tire tracks. And I will be getting a full service while I'm in price. The, the timing just worked out right. It's kind of too early, because 12,000 miles is really where I would be due for it. I don't know when I'm gonna have another pretty long break, and I don't know where I'm gonna be easily accessible to a dealership or to a shop. I could do some of the work, but some of it I, I need a shop to do it, like especially balancing the tires. But yeah, I'll have new tires for basically northern Nevada, which I'm probably gonna end up doing. I'll go down to Austin. Basically what I figured, so when I finish the Utah BDR, if I'm able to go all the way to the, the true finish, I'm still 400 miles from the start of the Idaho BDR, and I'm about that same distance, it's it's 50 more miles or something, if I just go down to Austin and start the Nevada BDR halfway up, do the northern half of the Nevada BDR, and then the Nevada and Idaho BDRs meet. That's the plan for right now. Probably not gonna do Oregon. As I said, the Oregon BDR is being released basically next year and there's no point in doing the old Oregon BDR if there's gonna be the correct one to do like next year. I saw the road over here, so I'm pretty sure I'm coming back. Yeah, there's a semi right there. I don't know if I'm just crossing the road or if I'm actually going back out and following it, but once I get into LaSalle, it's gonna be uh, cameras off and just road blast all the way to Moab. I do want to come back out at some point and do Lockhart Basin. That was a fun little section. It wasn't super technical. Five minutes later. I'm only 18 miles from LaSalle. Oh, there are literally thousands of trails around Moab. 
everything from jeeps to mountain bikes and hikers. All right, here's dirt. Pipeline of some kind. Yeah, I can smell natural gas. Which, natural gas is not technically poisonous. Except in like really large amounts where it displaces oxygen. Yeah, this road definitely washed out at some point. Thanks, bugs. Just keep flying up and hitting me in the face. I'm guessing this road is basically the service road for the pipeline slash pump stations. It's just uh, had better days. Haven't we all sometimes? But yeah, this used to be paved. Not quite so much anymore. Yeah, we're gonna go ahead and go a second. Just oh, chug through some stuff. God, yeah, just go straight up the hill. All right, that's a little sandy. Let's get through that. There we go. I'm assuming I'm going down to that road. Oh, that got messed up. I don't know where this goes. This looks like it got graded recently to fix it. Alright, where are we at? Six miles to LaSalle. Oh, okay, so. All right, I'm gonna kill the cameras here because I'm on pavement all the way to Moab. So I will see you in Moab, probably at the post office. A few moments later. Got my hard drive, got gas, got water for camp, and now I'm gonna get the fuck out of Moab. There are so many people in town right now. It is ridiculous. How's it going? Okay, cool. <laughs> Have a good one. Thank God he knew what that was. All right. Yep, just going straight through. Moab is a really cool town when it's not a holiday weekend. And don't try and come through on a Sunday, pretty much, because it's Utah. Really, there aren't too many places you can try and go through on a Sunday in Utah and actually have anything open. Oh, God. And there's just, there's no avoiding it. It's everything. Oh, that's beautiful. Can't fly the drone, it's too windy right now. That looks like a trail down there. Yep, it is. I don't know which trail it is, but it's something. Oh, my hand hurts. Just millions of little rock formations in here that are so unique. Oh, just look at that though. Five miles from the overlook. I think I'm gonna take a long break at the overlook. Probably have a snack. I have a Pepsi in my bag. Now that I'm basically out of Moab, I've accomplished my goal for the day. God, yeah, that wind is just whipping through here. This is fun riding. Like, now that I'm out of the washboard around Moab, this is just fun. You know, it's not super difficult or anything. The weather's nice. It's down to 72, so it's really comfortable. Oh, wow. Five minutes later. Looking at the map, I think I'm going to actually get into price tomorrow. Because I went quite a bit faster than I was expecting. No idea how long I'm on the road for. And I'm 48 miles from the end of the segment, which I believe is in... Oh, I just looked at it. There's a fuel stop there. Mountain biking up here. Hey! Hi, side of the road are you gonna drive on? Oh, I'm 
just look at that though. It really is just like riding along the edge of the Grand Canyon basically. I mean, it's not as impressive, but it's still impressive. <laughs> Based on this, I'm going up and over that. Yay. God, these are nice roads. Going left, technically. Wow. Wow. I'm not gonna get going too fast because I can see on the map that this road twists a lot. God, that view. I kinda hope I'm going over there to that road. Looks like I am. Oh man. That is just stunning. Holy Christ. You're bringing a freaking cattle truck up this? Yeesh. I don't think I've had a single person signal back correctly yet. I haven't had a single person attempt to signal back. That's pretty sandy. So yeah, this road's perfect as far as I'm concerned. Just technical enough. Just little things to keep it interesting here. And great views. Probably so, so if I get to Wellington, I don't know. I, I can't, there's no way. I can't get to Wellington today. Well, 145 miles from Price. Oh, that's gonna be deep. I want out of that. There we go, Jesus. Those ruts suck. We are gonna stay up high, because it's sandy down there. Looks like they just redid the road there because of a washout. And yeah, doesn't look like there's any big, big ruts there, so. Just gotta yeah, ease through it. Every time I think, you know, I should get the drone out for this, another 40 mile an hour wind gust comes along. Got basically white and red rock there, and I'm on essentially yellow. It's just every color you can think of, there's something out here. Cocapelli Trail, or just Cocapelli, I guess, because there is a town, right? Follow the rut. I really want to get up into this middle bit. There we go. Yeah, this is the Cocapelli Trail. Cocapelli is the little flute dude that you'll see on a lot of Southern and Native American stuff. Southwestern, not Southern. That's steep. We're gonna go to first. That's really steep. That'd be interesting trying to come up that. Sand pit. <laughs> Wasn't bad though. Yeah. Should be one more. All right, cool. It's the first bikers I have seen off road in Utah. Nine miles to Fisher Valley. A mile to whatever this overlook is. Oh, deep sand there. It's almost like the uh, steps on Black Bear. Yeah, and in this case, the steps are better because it means I don't have to do the sand. Well, now I do, but... See, and I wouldn't really call this difficult. This is fun, you know? It's technical riding, but you're basically, you know, you're just kind of easing it down the rocks. Sorry, I know I'm on the wrong side of the trail, but I need the better line. Yeah, going north to south on this, so going uphill on this bit, you would, uh, you'd be working. There's a couple of really good, 
little pogo stick climbs. Oh, the lookout's like right up here. Okay. Take a break for just a second. Oh, wow. Narrows of Onion Creek, 11 miles. Fisher Towers viewpoint. And probably campground, I'm guessing, is what that says. This is a fun trail. This would be a fun trail on a mountain bike. You could come blasting down here. Going up it on a dirt bike would definitely be a ton of fun. Oh, deep sand. Whoa. That's deep. Thankfully that was short. It was just from the wind mounding it up in that one little area. God, this trail is cambered way over in a couple of places. It's fun though. I'm just cruising through here in like second gear, first gear sometimes for some of the descents. Haven't had a first gear climb. Kind of hope I don't end up with one. Otherwise, you know, it's like this. You're, you're gonna hit sand here and there but it's mostly just kind of in between obstacles. Oops, don't hit that. It wouldn't be the easiest thing to climb, that's for sure. I see why they have you go down Cocapelli and not up it. Oh yeah, that's hike a bike territory for sure. I wish I could say you're near the top, but you're not. <laughs> Just me. Oh, that feels really good. <laughs> I'm sweating a lot. It's 82, at least the sun's not out, so that helps a lot. But yeah, I mean, I'm working hard. Oh, Jesus. We're gonna go down over here. sandy but not as steep oh steep turn okay oh very steep let's try and stay on the edge of the rocks we <laughs> Yeah, that would suck to try and go up. Also a hard no. <laughs> Loaded bike with luggage? No, thank you. Not on that bit. Oh, that's normally a water crossing. That's interesting. It's like barely damp right now. Biggest issue is I don't know what the sand looks like. Okay over here and up this we'll see if this is a uh, first or a second gear deal I think it's about to become a first gear deal in the runoff <sighs> yeah that's gonna be fun I want to stay right as much as I can and just first gear all the way <sighs> thankfully I'm almost to the top had to just don't stop Whew. 
Whew. Yeah, that's a good one. That was definitely the most challenging portion of the trail so far. Other than, you know, like Lockhart Basin, but that doesn't count because it's experts only. Oh, that's gorgeous. Wow. And the biggest advantage with that is that was relatively short. And that whole hill was 200 yards, maybe. There's one switchback. And if you got good tires and a good sense of engine management and throttle control, you shouldn't have any problems getting up that. It's not even two o'clock yet. <sighs> Just stunning. I got nothing to say. I'm tired because that was a workout. I don't know how much more I have of that, but I guess we're gonna find out. And I'm 19 miles from the end of the section. Oh, okay, so that's the Cocopelli Trail there. I'm not following it. I am off the Cocopelli Trail now, and I'm on something else. Honestly, I'm tired after that. That was just, that's a lot of work. It's fun as hell. Narrows of Onion Creek, less than a mile. Fisher Towers, six miles. Water crossings still always make me just a bit nervous. I think I'm gonna have to cross it probably two or three more times. Yep. This one's not bad though. Let's go there. Yep. Onion Creek. Here's another one. It's the first water crossings I've really had on this trip. It's probably a little bit cleaner than it was. <laughs> Where are we going? We're going through this lower part and I'm gonna do it slow. And right through. If it started raining back in here, I'd be finding some high ground and just camping like right there because I have to think this turns really nasty if it gets water down like rain and stuff. There'd just be, there would be water pouring off of everything. It'd be neat to see. It wouldn't be fun to ride through. <laughs> the how many more times do we cross the creek game I'm gonna say at least three I want to say I've crossed seven times now well, here's number two I'm probably gonna be wrong it's probably gonna be a lot more than what I thought yep <laughs> here's four Here's six. Seven. Nine. <laughs> oh, God. Ten. <laughs> it's just every couple of feet. We're gonna slow down because there might be some big rocks in this. Yep. <laughs> Barely, but it still counts. Here's 12. Okay, 
I think I'm going to work on getting to Thompson and see maybe if there's a place to stay in that in there in Thompson. All right, so this is apparently where Cocapelli comes out at. You guys want a big picture of your group or anything? Okay. Have a great ride, man. You too. They're doing Moab to Fruta. So Moab, Utah to Fruta, Colorado in one day. That is a day, holy crap. <laughs> So they're only about at their halfway mileage wise. Had somebody have a pretty good one, so they were fixing them up. But yeah, God, going from Moab to Fruta on, oh, on Memorial Day. That's a hell of a ride. And yeah. <laughs> no reason to go over the rock steps if I don't have to. Whew, the wind is whipping back here. Still in the 80s. It's just without the sun being out, it feels pretty okay. The wind helps a lot too when it's like this. Oh, we got Jeeps. Let's find a spot to let them go through. It's about as good as I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be here for a minute. Because I believe he indicated there was a, maybe a group of 22. <laughs> a few minutes later. Okay. All right. Good lord. I didn't count them, but that was a lot. That's the first gear climb for sure. Ooh, yeah, I want that line, I think. <laughs> I want dead center, I guess. Good God, that's Sandy. Okay, we're gonna slow down. First gear and I, oh God. I want that left side for sure. like doing this stuff when I'm tired, you know? Wasn't looking to go back into Rock Crawl City so soon. All right, first gear it is. the mine buildings. It's cool though. Talk about being in the middle of nowhere. Alright, right side this time it looks like. That was at least pretty short. Uh, I should have stopped at the campground back there. Well, I don't have a schedule, so... <sighs> this is really fun. Like, I just wasn't expecting this at the end of the day, you know? God, yeah, just right along the cliff edge. That's great. It's beautiful. Excuse me, lizard. You were booking it, man. All right, and pavement. Holy crap. Whew. Welcome back. 
into the RV park. The wind finally died down. Um, everything got covered in sand. I'm getting ready to go change into my sleeping clothes. Yeah, that will pretty much be it. I already downloaded footage. The biggest problem that I have is it's supposed to rain overnight and potentially end to tomorrow morning. So I don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> I may be on paper quite a bit. It should be a lot cooler tomorrow. So definitely not doing the jersey. So I'm gonna go to the bathroom, change clothes, and uh, get ready to go to sleep. It's about eight o'clock. So yeah, I will see you tomorrow morning. I have never had a sandier night than that. <clears throat> That's the worst sandstorm I've ever been in, in a tent. So it started raining at about midnight-ish, which thankfully toned the dust down a bit. But I mean, damage done, like, it's probably one of the first times I have ever woken up dirtier than I went to sleep. At some point, I definitely put my neck gear over my nose and mouth just to try and limit the amount of sand that I was ingesting. And that helped. That was one of the worst nights <laughs> camping I think I've ever had, and it's absolutely of no fault to the RV place. That wind was just unbelievable. I don't think I've ever been, like I've never had all my stuff that sandy in a tent. There was no escaping it. There was nothing you could do. It was just everything. I don't know what the off-road's gonna look like. It looks like it's raining over there right now. I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get over to the off-road, and if I run into just a muddy, nasty mess, I'm gonna unfortunately be on the pavement. Yeah, it's raining right there. You can see it coming down from the clouds. Five minutes later. I think I'm on pavement for most of this. I actually did just ride through rain, and we're gonna see, cause. If you can't tell, the ground is completely soaked. But I'm gonna get into Green River, which is 11 miles. Oh, hi, Antelope. Um, you're on the wrong side of the road for me, buddy. Can you, there we go. Hi, guys. God, yeah, last night was rough. I, I mean, I did sleep eventually. Once it rained, like once it started raining, that was kind of when I was able to get some sleep which I think it started raining at around midnight or so woke up and took a shower and it was just brown that, that is probably one of the first times I can think of where I have woken up dirtier than I went to sleep <laughs> we'll find out when I get over here but I mean basically the rule around here is if you can see rain ahead of you don't keep riding like don't ride into it because it'll be a mess if the wind pushes it towards you, you can just get stuck because then it, you can't get out. Like based on that, I'm not gonna ride into that because I know that it's raining there and raining pretty hard by the by the looks of it. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna follow my own rule. You don't ride into this shit if it's wet because you won't make it. So I mean that sucks, but I'm not gonna violate everything I've been saying. <laughs> A few moments later. One hour later. 
the good news is the place I'm staying is literally around the corner but yeah welcome to price it is quite nice actually okay we're gonna see what we can do here <laughs> day two all right I'm gonna go get gas and then we are gonna go ride the section that I couldn't ride yesterday running very light today because this is basically just a day trip. Hi, kitty. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kill the cameras here because there's no reason to run them when I gotta do nothing but pavement to get down there. And I will see you down by Green River when I get to the dirt. A few inches later. Okay. It hasn't had any weather on it for about 24 hours. I may run into a little bit of mud here and there, but it shouldn't be significant. And let's go have fun. 86 miles back to Wellington, and I'm running super light. So what I did was pulled the OS 18s off of the base for my luggage and put my engine bar bags which are OS 6, onto those. So I'm running basically just my tools and emergency equipment. I'm not running the tank bag, because I don't need it. I am so glad that I didn't do this yesterday though, because I got into several bits of rain getting into price, and then in price it rained another three times. So I would have just been in and out of rain all day is hopefully uploading day four of the New Mexico BDR right now. And I know you're looking at this going, well, this road is easy. Why didn't you just do it yesterday? And it is. The road is easy. It's nice and flat, straight as an arrow, whatever. The issue is when these roads get wet, they turn into soup. But yeah, I wanted to do this section. It's, you know, 90 miles basically of off-road that I had to bypass. So I get asked about my navigation tablet a lot. And I have mentioned before that it's made by a company called Carpe Eider. I'll have a link in the description because I don't actually know that I'm saying that correctly. And it's running a program called Drive Mode Dashboard 2. Now, when I did the Continental Divide and the Colorado and Arizona BDRs the first time, that was using Drive Mode Dashboard 1 on my own tablet, which was just a Samsung Active Tab 2. And it's the best motorcycling navigation app on road or off road that I've ever been able to find. If there was something better, I would try it. But and it also has this little Bluetooth controller down here that you'll see me using sometimes and basically allows me to control the tablet without taking my hands off the handlebars. And so I've been using this system now since basically 2020, late 2019, something like that. So about three years. I love it. The, the program allows you to download maps to the tablet. So I have basically all of North America downloaded to the tablet. And then it makes it really easy for you to put tracks on there and then follow those. So that's what I have right now that I'm following for the BDRs. I have all of the BDR GPS tracks downloaded to the device. And right now I'm just running Utah. And it gives you your next, basically two way, it gives you your entire, um, your distance to the next end of the track. And then it also gives you your next two closest waypoints. So like I'm two miles from Smith Cabin and then fuel in Wellington is the next waypoint. So you're able to set it to, um, you know, the direction that you're heading is up. You can also leave it on north is up if you want and have it track you. I prefer to have the direction that I'm going as showing up because it makes seeing what direction I'm turning a hell of a lot easier. It charges off the bike, so I, the Carpe Eider tablet comes with a dual power source system. So it uses the pogo pins that are in the back of the holder, and then it also has the wired connection, which is there on the right side, to charge the tablet while it's on the bike. And it has 
intelligent battery management so it doesn't always keep the tablet maxed out. It allows it to discharge and recharges it and does all that stuff on its own. It just works great. I'm going left. It has a bunch of other features that I'm not using regularly because I'm using for navigation most of the time. But it has just a dashboard display where it shows you speed and your odometer and all that stuff. You can get turn-by-turn -turn navigation, but it's through a third app. So I use Google Maps, and I just have Google Maps downloaded for a lot of the areas that I'm in. And so if you do a navigate to, it'll do it in Google Maps and shows it, you know, just like normal. You just don't get updates without a uh, SIM card and cell service, which I don't run on this. Your GPS signal is all handled through the device. Currently my GPS is accurate to 12 feet, and a lot of times it'll be accurate to, you know, 4. Some of the other things that it can do, it can Bluetooth to an OBD reader, and so you can read error codes on the bike and, you know, see whether everything's working correctly, get a bunch more sensor data from the bike. I have an OBD reader plugged in under the seat. If I ever need it, I just go to that page and turn the bike on. Yeah, it's just a great system. It turns on with the bike. I have it set right now so that it doesn't turn off when I turn off the bike. Just because I like to be able to see it a lot of the times, if I even if I had the bike turned off on taking a break or something. But you can have it set up so that when you turn the bike off, it turns the tablet off as well. The controller... I mean, the controller is just handy. To be able to control the tablet without taking your hands off the controls and the handlebars, that's really sandy. Go over here. There we go. And the biggest thing that I love about the controller is the battery life on the thing is just ridiculous. I have never killed the battery on it. I charge it maybe once a month. <laughs> It, yeah, I mean, most of the times when I plug it back in, I think it's still at like 60 or 70%. But it's just simple, it's basically a joystick, and you have three buttons, because the joystick is also a button. And you can control all the different features. This, the touch screen on the tablet obviously still works. Uh, the only times I've had a little bit of problems with that is if it's, I'm in like heavy rain. Every once in a while, the impedance screen will pick up raindrops as touch. Haven't ever had a problem with using it with gloves on. Honestly, it works better with gloves than my phone does. Really never have a problem with getting GPS signal. I've had a couple of small instances where it was struggling with accuracy just because I was in um, like a, a deep canyon or something like that. Tree cover hasn't really ever seemed to affect it that I'm aware of. It's not the cheapest solution out there for sure, but if you're looking at, you know, a Garmin 700i or an XT or whatever, you know, whatever system they're doing, you're getting just a nav. And on some of the Garmin devices, you also get, you know, emergency signaling and stuff in an emergency, but on this, it's, it's still an Android tablet. So, I mean, I have Gmail on there. I have YouTube. I, I have Google Translate downloaded to it. I haven't had to use it, but it's, it still works as a tablet. It's not the best tablet, but it can work as a tablet if you needed to. And that's something that you can't get a Garmin GPS to do. I think I'm going to be glad I came through here with no luggage on. Because <laughs> I'm wondering how sandy this is going to get. I'm going right up here. Because without luggage, this bike handles and floats so well in sand. But yeah, that's the tablet. I mean, you'll see me clicking through and stuff. I don't do a lot on it when I'm riding just because it's I don't want another distraction basically so I just leave it on navigation and but yeah I mean if I need to I can zoom in and zoom out I can change my view I can move around see where I'm at see if there's other trails with having the routes and the entire northern United States you know all of North America basically downloaded a tablet 
if I find something that's closed or that I want to divert around, I can look and see where the road goes. That's going to be deep sand. I'm going to try and go over here. Yep. I think I'm going to be real glad I'm running light. Oh, it is pretty back here. Yeah, very glad I don't have luggage on right now because the sand would be a workout. Oh yeah, there's some deep ruts in there. Just ease through this. I, there's ruts hidden underneath here and I'm trying not to get cross rutted. Screw it up, there we go. It is hilarious how much better this bike handles than sand when you take the luggage off. Yeah, this would not have been possible yesterday. It would have been more difficult with my luggage, but this wet just would not be doable. Boy, that is sandy. I went back over here, I think. Is it better in the middle? A little bit. Oh god, yeah. Because it's not great. Oh god, that's super deep. Okay. We're gonna get down to the lower line and just go nice and easy. There we go. Yeah, there's quite a bit of this that is just full sand. <laughs> just shows you how much easier stuff is when you're on lighter bikes or with no luggage. And third, yeah, okay. I could probably gear down for some of this, but oh man, it is pretty. Temperature's like perfect now. Okay, it's about 65. There's no wind. I, get the dr I just want to get slightly away from these power lines before I put the drone up. God, just deep sand. <laughs> oh, yeah. I am surprised that they did not note on the map deep sand. It should also be noted impassable when wet. Oh god. Alright, there it's a little more solid. Okay. <laughs> and you just cross into the different colors. You can see the people that have tried to come through here. Whoa. Big ol' rut. Yeah, we're gonna go slow. Yeah, it should be immediately obvious why a lot of this is not rideable if it's wet. <laughs> There's some deep ruts back in some of this stuff where people have clearly tried to go through. Oh yeah, look at this. Always pretty impressed at some of the stuff that people can get mountain bikes through. Granted, they're a lot lighter, and so they float a lot better. And I mean, like fat bikes, especially fat bikes, can go through basically anything. But I can't imagine this is a lot of fun to ride a mountain bike through. It's got to be a lot of work. I go up here. Yeah, this is just, this really is just talcum powder consistency. Let's go back over here. Whew, yeah, there's some deep stuff back in here. God damn. Go. It's really nice 
nice being able to just kind of tractor through this stuff. The KTM was so high strung, it would float better. So there's times where I would be able to get through parts of this easier. I couldn't touch as well. So dabbing is definitely not as easy. And uh, you can't lug it down low. God, yeah, you can see somebody went through. Probably fell over right there. They had a workout though. Digging a big old trench. Of course, I can't really tell how big of a trench I'm digging. <laughs> so for all I know, somebody else is gonna come through and look at my tracks and be like, God damn, they must have been struggling. <laughs> This would be a good trail for a TW200 or one of those uh, Upcos. Ooh, that is deep. God, it is gorgeous back here. Just look at all the tire tracks. <laughs> I think some people had trouble. <laughs> Pretty sure at some point this becomes a better road. But I guess we'll find out. Whoa, that was a big rut. Good God. Climbing this would not be a ton of fun. It's not really any worse than a lot of the other stuff, but deep talcum powder sand on a climb is not great to deal with, especially if there's ruts hidden in it is like that god damn it bonk there's the rut <laughs> okay looks like here's gonna be a gravel road Oof. Yeah, that's a good 15 mile workout. So far, it's just, oh, this might be really nice. I think I'm going to be probably crossing a bunch of washes in each 
beach wash is going to be another bit of sand. But yeah, this is almost, I mean, this is too true, true two track, which, I mean, side by sides have probably been down it and stuff, but you can tell there hasn't been too many passenger vehicles. Looks like, oh, the trail washed out, okay. Nice and easy. <sighs> it's actually in pretty good shape. Yeah, you can, I mean, you can see where the trail used to go. And then because of washouts and other issues, they keep having to divert around. I would say anytime you're coming down this section, you probably need to be washing, watching for trail washouts. Because you could absolutely be the first person to come down here after it's lost a chunk of trail. So yeah, oh god, Dewey Bridge to Wellington. Green River to Wellington. Lots and lots of deep sand. <laughs> also, completely impassable if wet. This is sandy on top, but I'm not sinking in. It's actually pretty nice. Oh god, that one was like right under my feet. For every lizard you're seeing on the camera, I'm probably seeing five. I'm really glad I didn't try and do this section yesterday. I can just about guarantee I would have ended up camped probably somewhere around here. Okay. I'm gonna go right there, I guess. This way, I think.
glad I did this section, but yeah, it's a, uh, a lot of sand. ravine there. Hang on, I'm gonna walk over there and look at it because it looks like the road's washed out. <sighs> right near Cedar Overlook Road. Yep. Eh, that's not horrible. You can go that way and go up that hill, but at least so far there's still a way through over here. You just don't see it initially when you're <laughs> rolling up here. And it is loose. Alright. That's probably going to last one more rainstorm. Maybe. If you get down here in the trailing here, hook a hard right. <laughs> and uh, do the best you can. Getting my meerkat on across the open lands of Utah. <laughs> Doing 45. I'm just blasting across here at 50 miles an hour, you know? Like, all the stuff earlier was a lot of fun for a very different reason. It was super technical, and in some places just flat out difficult. Whereas all this is just gorgeous. It's not the most technical of riding by any means. God, it is fun sometimes to just rip across here at 50. Oh, sun. Yes. Please. It's kind of freaking cold right now. the highway. Yeah, I'm gonna do that. I will kill the cameras here because there's no reason to keep going. So I will see you in price. Jennifer. New shoes, brake switch works now, fresh oil, and chain and sprocket. So we are doing good. God, she looks so clean. That ain't gonna last long. They got that done in literally hours. Alright, let's go. Ugh. Let's get back on the road. Just leaving Price. That was honestly a great little stay. I'm gonna be on pavement for a minute here, but I basically didn't record anything while I was in Price because all I did was work on editing footage. So I was able to get three videos done just while I was in Price. That was the Legacy Inn and RV Park. So it does have tent spots, it does have RV spots and stuff like that if you're not looking to stay in the motel. But the motel was very inexpensive and I picked it because all the reviews said that it was very clean considering how inexpensive it was and they were right it was in really good shape would highly recommend but yeah it's 240 miles roughly to Evanston I'll get gas at Soldier's what is it, Soldier Summit something like that the goal would be to get to Evanston sometime tomorrow afternoon.
and it's ba at this point it's basically just I'm I'm going north until I finish the route or I hit snow and stuff that turns me around and then I'll head over to the northern half of Nevada and then I'm not sure what Idaho is gonna be like everything up north got a ton of snow and I did the math and I have basically 42 days between now and the start of the Dakota 600 and I have roughly 20 days of riding to do to finish Utah, do Nevada, do Idaho, and do Washington. So hopefully that will be enough time to do those routes. It's just gonna come down to whether there's snow or not, really. I have water and food for camping, so I'm not worried about that. There's like a 10 mile diversion off of the course to get gas. Otherwise it's like 240 miles from Wellington to Evanston. So we ain't trying to do that in one trip. <laughs> Could I make it? Probably. Depends on how much gas I burn trying to get through like mud and snow. That's not what we're trying to do. The reason I'm, well, there's two reasons basically why I'm going over and doing the northern half of Nevada. One, it's open and the temperature won't be horrible. And two, it gives more time for stuff to clear. Okay. So yeah, here we go. Chipped at them and stuff. But yeah, you can see more of them right there. Those are really cool. And so these are from, I mean, hell, they could be from 500 years ago. They could be from 3,000 years ago. But yeah, that's neat. I'm gonna take a couple pictures and then uh, get back on the route. So I will catch you later. Okay, let's get onto the dirt. That is cool though. It just shows you though, this is all native land. White people did not discover this. There were already people living here. Nothing will fix that. We can't change the things that were done, you know? We, we can never make that right. The only thing we can try and do is acknowledge what was done and hopefully act differently going forward. You know, I'm in favor for anything that gives native peoples further agency in their lives because that was taken from them. It was taken from their grandparents and everybody else. So anything we can do now going forward to give them that agency back should be encouraged. All right, gotta keep an eye out for cows. I did stiffen up the preload in the front just slightly. Uh, I wanted it to try and ride a little bit more like what it was riding like when I didn't have the luggage on it. From my understanding of the route, I'm kind of past the like pretty technical stuff, I think. Doesn't mean I'm not gonna still hit some stuff that's pretty technical, but the stuff up here seems to be pretty chill. Should still be fun. And it should be absolutely beautiful. Hi, pretty painted horses. Hi, guys. That was a snake. It was just a little, like, garter snake or something. Sunning himself. I'm glad I didn't run him over. It's really pretty back here. I'm just going nice and slow. Getting used to the tires. Letting them break in. I will say the, uh... Rally front definitely has enough gap in the lugs to, to pick up rocks and throw them. <laughs> you will definitely throw rocks. I might, basically based on snow, what I may have to do is do northern Nevada and then go over to southern Washington and do Washington south to north because there's less snow on the Washington route than on the Idaho route. 
and so that would allow me to give another week or so you know basically i would be doing idaho then beginning of july and just give it that much longer to try and clear because there's a lot of snow in idaho right now like a lot of snow I don't think it's going to be clear in, you know, two weeks when I, when I get there. Hey, pretty guy. Hi. Bear Claw Valley. I like it. I will be bear bagging my food. I am back in bear country for sure. Gone 69 miles since price. hey -o. <laughs> Now what's encouraging so far is that I have not even seen snow like back in the trees. That's good. That means I might make it quite a while before I actually see snow. So if I'm not even seeing snow in the trees and I'm at 99,000 feet, you know, whatever, then that's very encouraging because it means that I could probably get to near 10,000 before there would be significant snow and stuff potentially on the roads. Yeah, you can see where this was probably a rutted up mess when it was wet. <laughs> bonk, 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 bonk. More RVs. Yeah, if you can get an RV that size back here, I'm not too worried. You know, I didn't actually look whether or not they put tubeless tires or tubed tires on here. Obviously it has tubes no matter what, because it's not a tubeless bike, but I, generally speaking, I will put tubeless tires on this bike, and it's because you have a stiffer sidewall, and it seems like they just kind of hold their shape a little bit better. I mean, even on the 690, I did the same thing. A lot of times I was running tubeless tires. You get a stronger sidewall. They handle low pressures better. It seems like they don't get flats as easily. It doesn't really matter, but just out of curiosity. Oh, there you go. Sorry, I gotta focus on not riding into one of the ruts. Oof. 55, yeah, it's uh, it feels really good right now to be honest because I'm not moving super fast and I'm off road so I'm working harder than normal. There's the first snow, all right, so I'm at 9,700 feet and that's the first time I have seen snow, so yeah, I think I will be fine until I am approaching 10,000 feet to not have snow on the road. Quite 10,000 feet. Can't put the drone up because the wind would slap it right off this ridge. And this, I mean, it, the riding basically from here to the finish should be very similar to this. Damn ruts, man. I keep trying to snag my front wheel. Not today, Satan. I saw a funny thing the other day. I think it was uh, maybe today. Like, what do we say to the God of Death? Uh, maybe today? <laughs> Three miles to the turnoff. And basically, Soldier Summit gas is just to get you that little bit of extra range you need to get to Evanston. I could probably do it without it but it would definitely be close. Yeah, eight miles to gas. Okay, so these aspens are starting to green up. Cool. Basically the next area where snow is really a concern is north of Current Creek. Nobody coming. Oof. Oh God. <laughs> That's worse than the dirt road. Eventually. All right, get back 
up here to the route. Those clouds look like I might get rained on. Oh, hi, sheep. I don't want to move you guys. I want you to get out of the way. God, the noise that they make. Whatever. saying a whole lot right now. I'm really just enjoying the riding. This is a ton of fun. It's, I mean, it's chill. Like, it's really chill riding. There's nothing difficult about this, really. But just look at that view. Mini Creek. <laughs> Was it named by Mini, or is it because it is Mini? God, that is just beautiful. Just a perfect little shelf road. And no gate. Cool. Man, I'm in second now. Yeah, let's just stay there for a minute. Because this appears like it's going to be more technical. Clearly not too many people have been down here this year. You know what, we're gonna go first. Just to keep it nice and slow. Oh yeah, we got ruts. Sorry tree, but I need through there. place to see elk and you know everything else but definitely elk like going up this you'd probably be okay because the soil's nice and grippy it feels like so there's definitely some loose bits all I'm really trying to do is not end up down in the lower of the two ravines that would not be fun to ride around in.
So yeah, after Fruitland, I'll start looking for a place to camp. I will look at campgrounds in Fruitland just to see if there are any up here along the route. And the reason a campground would be intriguing is they would probably have bear boxes. Either way, I'm definitely bear bagging the food and having my bear spray in the tent with me. I'm not stupid. <laughs> But yeah, basically all, most of the campgrounds around here and even in Colorado and stuff still have bear boxes in the campgrounds because it makes it way easier to safely store food. <laughs> Narrow bridge. Um, not exactly. Yeah, that bridge gone. <laughs> wow, that's really pretty. Looks like it flooded recently. Looks like they, uh, they re looks like that was maybe replanting. It's a little too evenly spaced to be natural. But yeah, it looks like they rebuilt this road because of a washout. Oh, it's solid. Okay, they put concrete there. It's like swirling. There's some bigger rocks in here too. Oh. Yeah, you can see where this all burned. So I'm sure the flood happened a year or two later, as it does. Whew. Yeah, I wonder when all this burned. It burned bad. I mean, it, it sterilized, it looks like, because these trees are just dead. That's when you know a forest fire is bad, is when several years later the trees haven't even started regrowing. I mean, even the grass in a lot of areas hasn't really come back. Oh, here's the pavement. Okay. Eight miles to Fruitland. I will see you there, I guess. Later. So I was able to check the map, and there is camping at Current Creek Reservoir, which is not terribly far away so the plan for right now is just get up to current creek Res reservoir find a spot camp up fruitland's little uh convenience store slash whatever that was was popping man god i walked in there was probably 50 people in there I mean, granted, it's probably the only place around here where you can really get gas and, you know, like some food and stuff. But, geez. God, this is beautiful back here. Wow. And there's actually water. It's just shocking, considering how dry everywhere else I have been this trip has been. 14 miles. This has to go to dirt at some point, right? And here's dirt. Okay. Oh, God. And washboard. Hopefully it's not too bad. I've been really pretty impressed with Utah's roads. Other than the couple of areas right around Moab, which are just super busy. There hasn't really been much in the way of washboard roads. Most of the roads like this have been in really good shape. <laughs> After I just got done talking about how nice the roads have been in Utah. Ugh. Ugh, really? Well, guess not. Why would that not be open yet? Like, Memorial Day weekend is like the weekend to open this stuff. I have no idea if this keeps going up or if I start going down here soon. Like, I have no idea. I mean, I can't keep going up too much further. I'm nearly at the top. Which is kind of the only reason why I'm still going on this because I already know I'm fairly near the top and so I should come over here and start going down a little bit. So pretty. I mean, it's still only 3.30. Like, I got plenty of time. 
it's not a big deal if I go a little further. Here's the first snow. I'm right about 9,000 feet in the shadows. Yeah, here's snow. Okay, I think the top is like right over here. Okay, there's a little bit of snow on the road over here. But it looks like I have paths. So we're just gonna take this nice and easy all the way through. And that was right at 9,700 feet. Let's take the high line here. Definitely been some fairly large vehicles that have come through. And this stuff, I mean, I can literally just like walk almost. As long as there is a path to follow, that's all I need. Okay, there's one more big snow drift after this, it looks like. Oh yeah, I might be going, yeah, I'm gonna be going around. <laughs> Sorry, but I ain't doing that. Ah, shit. I go right through here. What are we looking like? That's not too bad. It's muddy, but it's in pretty good shape. Okay, so that's a nope. I ain't plowing a path through that. There's nowhere to go through. I'll just sink. All right, we're gonna turn around. But yeah, there you go. This is the uh, current Creek Pass. On a four by four, you can do it for sure. On, if you had several friends, you could probably do it, but not by myself but yeah basically I'm fine until 10,000 feet and then it goes and now I gotta go all the way back down there And yeah, I mean, there's no way to get through that. Like, I could take all the luggage off and try and walk the bike through, but all I would probably do is dig a hole. <laughs> Whew. Yeah. If you had five guys, you could get your bikes through. You might have to take all the luggage off if they were a big bike. Five guys willing to make the effort like at the beginning of the day or something, you could get the bikes through. What if I could do that? Connect over to US 40 on whatever this road is coming up. Because it looks like I'm gonna have to do 40 to reconnect to the route. And it would save me going back down washboard gravel hell for 20 more miles. Yeah, we're gonna do that. All right, I am going straight. We'll see where this road goes. It goes straight down to 40, so I'd like to at least maybe get under 8,000 feet just so that it's a little bit more comfortable overnight. Stuff like this is why you do not pass the opportunity to get gas on a BDR. Because I have no idea how much shorter or longer this is going to make my trip to Evanston. All right, so I'm gonna get down here. I'm gonna pull over and see what my options might be. All right. 
I will see you when I see you. Welcome to the Lodgepole Campground. And we're gonna see what we got. That's a double sight, I don't want that. I could do that though. All right, I'm gonna drop a couple of little things. Oh God, just to mark it as mine and then go pay. Okay, I'm not gonna record much because um, rain. <laughs> I've said it before and I will say it every time, there is absolutely nothing worse than setting up or taking down camp in the rain. So, most of my stuff is pretty damp. I'm wearing my mid layer, so I should be comfortable enough. And I've got basically 60 miles until I reconnect with the route. I'm actually only gonna end up skipping probably 10 or 15 miles of the route. I just have to go around kind of a long way. And I will catch you further up the road. All right, we're gonna find out if I can do this or not. Supposedly, I should be able to follow this all the way up to where the route reconnects. And I did confirm Bald Mountain Pass is the highest point of the Utah BDR. It's a little bit above 10,000 feet, but I should be on a paved road for that whole bit. All right, so that wasn't a 60 mile diversion. Just thankfully, I was able to see it on the map and find a different way back. But yeah, we'll see what it uh, looks like up here. It is really beautiful up here. It's just too bad that it's rainy. And of the days to be rainy though, this is probably one of the better ones because the route is already a significant amount of pavement because you're following Highway, 50, Highway 150. All right, so my route is coming in from my right. All right, back on the route. So yeah, I missed roughly 15 miles from Current Creek Pass to here because I was right about 100 miles to Evanston when I had to turn around at Current Creek. Soapstone Pass. And it, we're gonna try it. Maybe not what I should be doing, but damn it, I came out here to ride. And it's barely raining now, so hopefully this is not just a muddy mess. I've got fresh tires on the bike, and hopefully I don't hit snow. So far, this is pretty good though. I'm worried I might actually hit a snow drift when I get up here, but we'll find out. Based on the map, this is a very short section of dirt. It's only probably maybe five miles because it just goes right up over Soapstone Pass and then it drops back to the other paved road which is on the other side here. It's also nice that it's just barely sprinkling on me right now. Oh, I'm glad I decided to make a try at it. Even if I get up here and it's blocked by a snow drift, it's still pretty. And this is also not that clay stuff, so it doesn't get snotty when it gets wet. Right now it's just damp enough to where it's, it's not, it's a little bit past hero dirt. It's a little too wet for that. My bike said 46 this morning. I'm not sure I believe that, but it was definitely not warm. Just please don't have snow on the other side. There's definitely more coming. You can see it over there. Get down here, I may have to throw my rain jacket on just for the wind protection. Heated hand grips for the wind. Oh yeah, this is actually in really good shape. I did not want to have to fight with a muddy, snowy mess. I 
lights are up at this point so I can see. Visibility is a little bit more important than comfort right now. Yeah, I'm gonna get down here to the pavement and I will throw my rain jacket on. Heated hand grips are working wonderfully. It's just, it's basically the rest of me that's making me cold. <laughs> Oh, God. I mean, today's going to be a, kind of a short day no matter what. Because I'm only 78 miles from uh, Evanston now. And, yeah, I'll use the time to edit footage. Alright, camera's going off for a minute. Ran into a lady who was camping up here. She's like, yeah, if you camp in the area, make sure you're careful about bears. I had one on my porch this morning. It's like, oh, yeah, okay. But, yeah, we're getting close to... Bald Mountain Pass, which is the tallest point of the BDR. Still not warm. The highest temp I have seen today was 55. Since it's down to 46. There's 10,000. I am sure the cameras can't see shit. The rear facing might be okay. 10-7-3. Yes, please, Bob. You would be greatly appreciated right now. Ugh. Full body shiver. Can't tell if it's sandy or if it's just kind of rutted up almost. It's a very weird sensation. I think because of all the rain, it's tamped down really nicely. Because it doesn't feel loose. This is almost two track. This is going to be a walking one. I don't feel like doing this. I feel like I'm just going to drop the bike again. And this time it'll be in the water. So, I'm going to work on getting flipped around. But yeah, I'm gonna go ride back up that. And I'll go back to the damn road. Not worth it right now. All right, I'm gonna get stuff figured out. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah, I just, I don't wanna do that. I feel like I'm gonna drop my bike and I don't wanna have to deal with it. That water's really running high right now. It's obviously pretty close to peak runoff. And with the rain earlier today, it is high just not worth the risk to me. So I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna take 150 into Evanston. Because I want to go right here. There we go. Oh, I'm sure that's a really fun water crossing when the water's not knee high. You know, that was high enough where if I was going to have to do it, I would be walking next to the bike. It was, it was that deep. No interest in doing that right now by myself. Water crossings are still kind of the thing that give me the most anxiety. I just, I have a lot of anxiety when I try and do those water crossings, especially by myself. Because if I drown the bike, I, you know, I'm kind of screwed, like just suck a lot but yeah I mean I kind of walked back in there trying to find what the best line would have been I mean in the center there it looked like it was gonna be nearly waist-deep the edges were definitely above my boots 
and uh, closer to like knee, knee deep. And there was a fair amount of big rocks in the bottom of that. So, you know, just riding through was not an option. And walking it through would have been a really difficult little stretch. So, sorry, but I gotta be able to get through some of these places. So I get down here to the road, I will plug in different directions. Um, and I'll probably go ahead and just stop recording once I get back to the road. Because I'm just going to be on pavement and it's not actually part of the route. Alright, I'm going to crank the music and just ride, so I'm not expecting much out of the video. Alright, welcome to Evanston. Much, much, much later. Just heading out of Evanston to finish the Utah BR. I'm on highway for this whole first stretch, so I'm not really filming much. Today was the first day where I forgot where I was. I was sitting here at the gas station and I legitimately could not remember the name of the town that I was in. <laughs> like, at all. I, ha I wasn't even close. I had no idea. I may or may, I don't know, depending on how today goes, I may not stay in Garden City, which is where the Utah BR ends. What I may end up doing, going part way towards Austin, Nevada, and that's like 450 miles or something, so if I was able to do, you know, 150 of it or something, it would make tomorrow a lot more pleasant. So, I will sign off. And I will talk to you in probably a couple hours when I get to the Monte Cristo range, which is 63 miles away. A few inches later. There it is. This might be some real slow going. Oh yeah, okay. Nope. If that's what it looks like this close to the road, I ain't doing it. I'm at 8,600 feet, and it's already muddy. We ain't doing that. That's gonna be a hard no. I mean, I'm 100 yards off the pavement. Like, there's already snow completely crossing the road. So, not happening.